Did Eve lie when she said that the Lord said not to even touch of the fruit? Whether she did or didn't, doesn't even matter. Hey, smart Christians, welcome back. Obviously, the more we get closer to his return, the more you're going to see some, some bad teachings, some false teachings, some that are intentional, some are unintentional, some because we're maybe doing too much thinking, who knows. But when you start messing with the reliability of the scriptures in one area, obviously you're going to have to deal with that same, if you're going to be consistent, you have to deal with the same issue as to whether the scriptures are reliable or unreliable or how we should interpret it in other parts. We'll go to that part in just a little bit. We'll cover that in just a second, but I want to talk about something that comes up. It just came up recently, as a matter of fact, and for some, it seems like it might be a small issue. In Genesis 2, God tells Adam not to eat of the fruit. So let's read it. Verse 15, then the Lord God took the man to put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, that part we know. The issue comes in when Satan encounters Eve, or when Eve encounters Satan in chapter 3. She says it, but she says it a little bit differently. She adds something. Chapter 3, verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So herein lies the issue. People have just come up with all sorts of issues or, or commentary as to what happened here because she's added in, verse, in this chapter something that is not stated in chapter 2. So let me just say this first. Here we are 2021. We're in the 21st century and we feel as though we are really close to arriving in terms in terms of being intellectually there. We feel like we are smarter than our parents and our parents' parents. We feel like we're the best thing since sliced bread, right? What we forget sometimes is we weren't there. This was a text that was written not in the 21st century or in Western culture. This is an Eastern text written thousands and thousands of years ago. Sometimes what we do, even in an honest attempt to understand the scriptures is, we insert ourselves in how we would act or how we would read or how we would think or what we would say or what we would do, right? The issue is we have no idea what it would even be like in that situation. I mean, think about it. Could your parents even, or your grandparents or great grandparents fathom what it would be like to be living in this culture or you living in their culture, right? So what we do sometimes is we insert ourselves to try to get a better understanding, but sometimes we just can't do that. It's just not possible. And what we do is we insert ourselves in this and say that, wait a second, that's not what God said, what Eve said, that's not what God said. But let's think about something here for a second. Why is there a need or a, even a reason to even think that Eve lied? What is a lie? A lie is a sin. Now let me ask you a question. Think about this. Of all the people that we can ever think of, all the characters in the Bible, of everyone that's ever existed. We know that Jesus has never sinned, but taking him out of the equation, can you think of anyone else that has ever at any point in their life lived without sinning? Well, these two, Adam and Eve, they didn't finish their life sinless, but they started off that way. And up until this point, before they eat of the fruit, and I guess maybe as the desire comes in, they had not sinned. <clears throat> Here is a sinless woman stating to the author of, of, of confusion, to the author of sin, stating to him, you should not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The, the touching part, because it wasn't mentioned in chapter 2, causes some issues. Well, if because some added details were added into this uh, chapter, well then, shouldn't chapter 2 cause you to not trust chapter 1 of Genesis since they're the same account, but there's added detail in chapter 2. That happens from time to time. But even more than that, again, we're talking about someone at this point who has not sinned. 
So why is there a need to believe that she's sinning now? Sinning is not an issue. As a matter of fact, if we read another account talking about this or kind of touching this, this issue, we don't see that this was the reason why she sinned. So let's turn to uh, see what Paul has to say when addressing Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 14, he says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Here's what it is. Adam sinned. Adam willfully went against or did, uh, did the opposite of what God told him to do. But it says that Eve, her issue was she was deceived. Well, when was she deceived? Well, she was deceived by what Satan tells her afterwards. Obviously, he plays onto some of her emotions and the desires. She says that, that she saw that the, that the fruit was pleasant and good. And so he plays onto that and builds off of that. And so she's deceived. But it doesn't say or anywhere else in the scripture that she sinned in saying that you should not touch the fruit. Here's another reason why we know that she didn't lie. Who's telling the story? Moses is telling the story. Moses could have easily told us that she lied. He tells us everywhere else, as far as he has an opportunity to, to tell us when he's writing the scriptures that she lied. Paul never brings it up. He could have said that also Eve lied, she sinned. He doesn't. He said that Adam sinned, that Eve was deceived. Jesus never says that, uh, that Eve lied. And then more to the point, who again is telling Moses the story? Moses was not there in the beginning. Who was there with Adam and Eve? Who's the only person that could have told Moses what was going on? God. God is not someone who gives a wink and a nod to sin. And so had she lied, that certainly would have been indicated there. Everything else is indicated. So clearly Eve has not lied. God has told them this. How do we know God has told them this? It doesn't say so specifically. Well, think about this. How much time has passed between the time that God said, you shall not eat of it in chapter two and chapter three? How much time has passed? Does anybody know? No, we don't know. No one knows how much time has passed. Could it have been a day? Could it have been weeks, months, years? Could have been, we don't know. But since we are in such a hurry to talk about or to place ourselves in this situation, so now place yourself here and ask yourself this question. Do you think God created Adam and Eve, told them one or two things, and then was silent? Well, we know they had occasion to speak with God why? Because we hear the voice of God walking through the garden after they've eaten and they hide. So they're, they're fully aware of who God is. They've had interactions with God. They know God. And so it'd be hard to imagine that God spoke to them once or twice and that was it. So it's likely that God, I can't say definitively, but it's likely that God had spoken with them, not just on day one that they were created or a few days after that point that God was not involved in their lives. God is, in, God is involved in everyone else's life, but on the first two people that he created, he was not involved in their lives. That makes no sense, does it? Could be wrong, but I think that fits more than anything else that God had told her. God had, she had, it's not like Adam was the only one that spoke to God, that Eve didn't know who God was or had spoken to him. And so I believe that she gave a correct account that you should not touch it either. Now, and it's interesting that Satan did not say, God did not say that you should not touch it. <clears throat> well, here's the other question. Here's the big question. Does it matter? It's not a salvation issue, or is it? Does this matter? Well, absolutely it matters. Why? If you say that Eve sinned, that Eve lied before, then what you're doing is, it's the very definition of eisegesis. You are reading into the passage. You are saying something that it doesn't say. Well, Corey, when you say that God has probably spoken to Eve before, are you reading to the passage? You could say that. What I'm not saying is, though, that she sinned, which the Bible doesn't say. So since the Bible doesn't say she sinned, guess who else is not going to say she sinned at that point? Me. The Bible didn't say she lied. I won't say she lied. The Bible gave, a, I think, an accurate account of what she said. And I think that she gave an accurate account of what God said. It was a sinless woman who we've never met a sinless person before. At that point, she was a sinless woman. And she gave an account of what God said. That's all you have to do is take it at that. But when you get into the habit of eisegeting, when you read into something that you may feel or you take your understanding, that's hard to do, especially when, when we're reading into these texts that are older. We don't understand the culture. We don't understand what's happening. There are many passages that we do that too. And if you can do it with this passage, 
Well, why can't you do with other passages? When you say that this is what he meant or what she meant, and some of you have seen my video about William Lane Craig and there'll be more about him if you haven't seen those, where I have this huge problem and I think he really ought to. And I said, I was, I was blunt and I was clear and I meant it, shut up, go home. When you start exegeting, and not only you exegeting a text, but teaching others to do so as well, what you're saying is, I don't believe God that the way you conveyed this text, the way that you um, explained this was the proper way. To the writer, you said this the wrong way. What you should have said was this. This is how they would have understood this. And they don't. It assumes that your eisegete assumes that there is a better way to relate the story. That God could have done a better job in communicating this. Now, are there some passages that the translations could have been better? Sure. But that's an issue with the translator of the text rather than the communicator of the text. Remember, the whole point of the Bible is getting across a particular message, not necessarily being verbatim, but the idea across, which is why sometimes you'll see, many times in the New Testament, you'll see them quoting not the Old Testament Hebrew Masoretic text, but you'll see them quoting the, the Greek Septuagint. And sometimes you'll see the same account of something given different ways. Look at the gospel, the gospel accounts of the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's like if I say, if I say it's 15 till 5, or you say it's 445. We said the same thing in a different way. Well, that's not, that's not an issue with communicating the same thing. But when someone says no, what he really means is that we've only got 15 minutes left to live, or we find some deep spiritual meaning, that's the wrong way to read scriptures. It's what William Lane Craig, William Lane Craig is trying to do. That's what anyone who reads into uh, whether Eve sinned prior to God saying she sinned has done. And again, if you can do it here, you can do it when you get into the Gospels. You can do it when you get into Paul's writing. You, we, we certainly see when people, when people go to the, the, uh, the book of Revelation, we see that. We see that with other prophecies. God is trying to speak to people who just aren't that bright. I know it comes as a shock. We think that we are more there than we really are. We think that we know something, right? And God has spoken to us about having this wisdom of our own and thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We still, we still avoid that though. We still think that we're hot stuff. And so God is speaking to people who he calls sheep. Sheep aren't very bright, sheep are dumb. He's speaking to us in a way that we would understand. So how would the writer have intended this to be understood? And then how would the people at that time have understood it? Remember, since we think we're so much smarter than everyone else, these people who couldn't think themselves out of a wet paper bag, I guess, how would they have understood it? Well, they would have understood it in a much better way than we do, that's for sure. They took God literally at his word. And I think that we would do ourselves a great favor to do the same thing. And if we're going to be a teacher, if we're going to teach or preach to someone something that the scripture doesn't say, you better be absolutely correct. Because there's a greater and a more stricter judgment or condemnation against those who do it and do it the wrong way. So let's just let the text say what it says. If it doesn't make sense to you or that seems too fantastic or too fanciful or it's not the way you would have done it, fine. If it's not the way you would have done it, if it's not the way you would have said it, then here's what you do. Become God, create your own universe, and then we'll just see how you do it. But until then, just go with what the word says. Amen.